Thank you very much indeed to both Denise and Claire and welcome to everybody. And we do appreciate so many people joining us from so many parts of the world. We hope you'll find this uh, useful. Um, you've heard about PAI and uh, people who are with you today. You've already met Claire and uh, Denise. Uh, I'm Neil McCallum. Tim Salt uh, is with us, as well as Caroline Lamptey. Caroline Lamptey. Uh, and what we want to do today is to spend an hour with you. Um, during that time, I'm going to spend a very short time on introducing some concepts, many of which will be familiar to you, but I just want to make sure that um, the way in which we are choosing to describe things uh, either matches to yours or, or where there are differences, perhaps we can explore those. We're going to be talking about what's new in this present situation. Um, and we have already sort of laid out our thoughts in the very title of this about old frauds in new situations. Um, we're going to look at a case study, which Tim will take us through, of um, a major fraud, which illustrates some really important points about both uh, the nature of fraud um, and the present situation uh, that we are in. Carolyn will be um, introducing us to a two-pronged approach to try and address uh, the impacts of fraud and corruption. Uh, and we shall end with a discussion of what we'll do now, what we should be doing now. So the structure is we're going to discuss some things, including key principles, some ideas and suggestions. As Denise said, there will be a poll and there is the chat room, which um, on previous webinars has proved to be an incredibly fertile place for ideas to be exchanged, not just between PAI and your good selves, but um, across countries and across the globe. And we've certainly seen some really innovative ideas spread uh, literally right across the globe in the chat room. So I encourage you as you are, thank you very much for, for using that and make full advantage of the fact that this is bringing together people from all over the world. Uh, we will have a period for questions and answers. And so um, the third box down, I think, is the questions box. Please put questions in there as they occur to you. Um, we'll address them in uh, a, a group at the end, uh, but please don't wait till the end to send them in. Send them in as we go along and we'll address them as much as we can. And then we'll end very quickly with a review and talk about potential for future such discussions. So who are we? Well, Tim Salt um, has a background in policing. That is Tim Salt a few years ago now. Um, 30 odd years in the police, um, becoming for uh, the latter part of his career, a not just UK leader, but a world leader on the investigation of fraud and corruption and represented um, the UK at numerous international um, fora, still as a, a police officer, uh, then embarked upon a, a career as an academic, setting up um, the first MA in uh, fraud management in Britain. Uh, and we have worked together as advisors and consultants and trainers on issues of fraud and corruption um, in a number of countries. Tim has done that um, with others. And recently, the two of us have been working together. I mean, in fact, most recently, we were working together in Kazakhstan. Caroline Lamptey, I have no idea, and sincere apologies to her for her picture having gone sideways. Um, that isn't how it looks in the uh, PowerPoint. <laughs> so I have no idea why that's done that. Um, has a background as a uh, prosecutor, is one of the UK's senior prosecutors uh, from our Crown Prosecution Service, um, and has worked internationally increasingly on the issues around um, asset recovery um, and has, has led significant exercises on that, both in Egypt and most recently in Ghana. And this is me. Again, you'll see we've gone for a theme of um, going back a few years. And in my case, we've gone back far enough that I still had hair on the top of my head. And in fact, it was quite dark. 
Um, this is probably back in the 1980s. My background is in government service, particularly involved with information handling and um, using the power of information uh, for both planning purposes and also for um, transparency and accountability. For the last um, 20 odd years, probably more now, I've been working internationally on these issues and increasingly in the justice sectors and on fraud and corruption matters. Um, this is a very quick map of the countries that we've worked in. You will see it's very much weighted to one side of the, if we have a side of a globe, uh, one side of the map. Uh, there are some tiny little blue dots in the Caribbean where we've worked uh, as well, but um, doesn't really show up. But uh, we have uh, worked on these things in a fair number of places. And I mention it simply because whilst today we may well be drawing on UK and Ghana examples, that is simply because that's where we have most recent experience of but we're only using them as examples and as i think will become very clear um as we go through those examples we are certainly not saying that particularly with the uk we are holding ourselves up as any kind of example of how to do things these are cases which we'll explore which we feel confident we can discuss effectively so very quickly then what we're talking about today is fraud and corruption, terms which are often used in different countries to mean different things. So this is why I've put up the way in which we are using them here. And when we talk about fraud, we are talking about the intentional use of deceit to deprive a person or organization of value. It is very often money, but it is not exclusively money. It could be property or a lawful right. The key thing is these elements of intention, deceit and deprivation. And fraud can be internal or external. And many organizations tend to focus more on the external threats, whereas a significant number of sizable frauds are committed by people within the organization. Corruption, when we discuss this, uh, we are talking about dishonest or unethical behavior by a person, and this is the key difference, entrusted with a position of authority. The abuse of power is a key element of corruption. Um, the nature, the way that corruption displays itself will be infinitely variable, but the one thing all corruption matters have in common is this abuse of trust. Um, people talk a lot about different types of corruption, grand corruption, petty corruption, quiet corruption, noble cause corruption. There's all sorts of, of ways of looking at corruption. If And if any of those are of particular interest to you, please mention it in the questions. We'll be happy to expand upon those terms. But the key thing is, however it is described, there is an element of abuse of trust. And uh, academics and professionals have for decades now talked about an analysis of fraud in terms of the fraud triangle, which recognizes that a common, uh, three common elements in any fraud are the opportunity to commit it, the motivation to do so, and something which perhaps is more surprising, the element of rationalization and the way in which people justify uh, their acts to themselves. And more recently, the fraud uh, diamond uh, picks up on those same three elements, but also adds capability. Um, and I think that's uh, a, a bit, both very useful models, as in a, is a model of looking at corruption in terms of the key elements uh, and tasks that we should focus on of prevention, detection, investigation, prosecution, sanction, and if we are effective in going around that cycle, then the, uh, the effective application of relevant sanctions is in itself uh, a, a lead on to prevention. 
We, however, uh, see things uh, in a fairly simplistic way. And this is our view of organizations, nations, and indeed the whole world. There are good people and there are bad people. And uh, I am using Christian iconography of halos and devil's horns simply because those are the images I could find to do so. Um, but this applies everywhere, we think. There are good people, there are bad people. And there's a lot of people who are neither good nor bad. And that's really quite important because the good people, for those of us who are involved in trying to combat fraud and corruption, we don't need to worry about them. They will find out the right way to do something. If they're in doubt, they will check, they will ask. They will not push the boundaries. And the bad people, well, our approach to them has to be different. We have to do everything possible to make it difficult for them to commit crime against us. But our preventative uh, culture is not really going to change those people. It's the people in the middle. The people who are neither innately good nor innately bad, but whose actions are affected by circumstance, which are the ones which should be our primary concern, particularly when we focus on issues of prevention. And again, another part of our view is that most places break down like this. There may be 5% of the population are these innately good people. And some of my colleagues um, are proud to claim that they're in there. And that's a discussion we often have. Um, none of my colleagues, I'm pleased to say, and nor would I say that they should claim to be in the 5% of bad people. Uh, I am perfectly happy to accept, and I think many, many people are, as this model shows, in the 90%. Now, you may argue um, that your society, your organization, comprises 20% of innately good people and only 5% of bad people, but that still would leave 75%, the vast majority, in this middle box. And this is good because these are people whose behavior we can affect by making it as easy as possible for them to do the right thing and as difficult as possible for them to do the wrong thing and for the boundary between those to be very, very clear. And many organizations fail um, because we set up bureaucratic and overly complex systems, which kind of encourages people to start breaking the rules simply to do their jobs. When we look at corruption, we see corruption also in pretty simplistic terms. We see the issues around corruption as being a simple matter for those in the middle box who will either be good or bad, depending on the circumstances, as a simple relationship between cost and benefit. To put it simply, if the price of a corrupt act and the risk of being caught, and if caught, suffering a significant penalty, is much heavier than the potential reward that the corrupt act could obtain, there will be less corruption. If the price of the corrupt act, the bribe or whatever, is low, and the risk of being caught is low, and even if you're caught, any significant penalty is unlikely, compared to the benefit which you can gain from the corrupt act, there will be more corruption. This is not making a moral judgment. This is a statement of, for that 90% in the middle, a logical decision about what to do. So that's the world as we see it. And the terrible situation that we're in now does not basically change that situation. We will argue that there are not more corrupt people than there were before. There are certainly not more types of corruption than there were before, 
But there is far greater opportunity in certain areas than ever before. And that's a thing which we want to explore with you. And we want to explore that through um, thinking about some of the things that we hear are happening. And these are some stories um, from the UK. And as I said, we've deliberately chosen the UK, um, all from one newspaper. Suppliers with political contacts were given their own high priority lane and were 10 times more likely to get government contracts. Companies with no relevant experience uh, received 12 billion pounds in what the newspaper describes as a shambolic scramble for personal protective equipment, PPE. And in one case, a US jewelry designer was handed a number of lucrative contracts worth 200 million pounds after he started providing gloves and gowns for the National Health Service. Uh, linked to that, a young entrepreneur was given a contract worth 880,000 um, pounds. These are often suppliers with no experience. Um, and this is a matter of national concern in the UK, and it will be one of growing concern. And this will rumble on, I predict, for years in inquiries and potentially uh, prosecutions, who knows. But it is important to remember that some people have made a lot of money, have done very well during this crisis, quite legally, quite legally. It's not against the law to make a profit, not against the law to do smart business at a time of crisis. And it's also important that we remind ourselves that not every press report or allegation made is accurate. But safeguards may be lowered in a crisis, which has provided opportunities for the unscrupulous. And it's important that companies resist, as EY have commented in the report, which is quoted there, the temptation to sacrifice their controls, systems, governance, and culture in adjusting to the new realities of COVID-19. And we like that quote because it picks up um, an important point, but also the four key elements we look at when we consider um, fraud, resilience, um, and anti-corruption approaches within organizations. Controls, systems, governance, and culture. Where controls are in place, have they been ignored, bypassed, or have they simply broken down? Have they been adapted to the changing circumstances? Are they sufficiently transparent? And are people sufficiently accountable? And certainly in many cases that we're aware of, the answer to both those questions are no. And we have to be wary of the uh, view that a crisis uh, justifies a panic and the end justifies the means. And we have there a quote from um, the UK's Prime Minister. We shifted heaven and earth to get 32 billion items of PPE into this country. I'm very proud of what has been achieved. And there are big questions uh, that that statement invites. Now, I said that we would look at one individual case uh, to illustrate a lot of these things. I'll invite my colleague and friend, Tim Salt, uh, to uh, explore that with us. So, Tim, if you'd be so kind. Yes, thank you very much, Neil. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, I'm going to go through a case study and very much hopefully reflect in uh, what Neil has, has just been telling us. Um, the case that I'm looking at is one which uh, was publicised really by Interpol, and they issue some court, some alert advice right at the beginning, which says quite simply criminals are just waiting to make a fortune 
from COVID-19. And three words of advice at the bottom, to be vigilant, be sceptical and be safe. And as we go through the case study, we're going to look at the fact that I believe very much it's an old fraud. There's nothing new about it, but we are with the pandemic in new times. And as we go through the case study, I would ask you to reflect upon what Neil said and see if you can pick out occasions where possible safeguards within systems have been lowered or even ignored. Try and look to see whenever the victims in this case had made any effort to adapt to the new times that the pandemic has brought to us. Does the end justify the means, as Neil says at the end? It also fits in, of course, to the fraud triangle and rationalising. It's very easy to justify what we've done by saying that the end result justified the need. And that might be true. It might be necessary on occasions. But again, I come back to Neil's point. Is Are the people making the decisions accountable? Are the processes transparent? And very crucially, particularly in the public sector, has there been any conflict of interest arising? So we'll look into the case study, which is a scam, fairly straightforward, involving the use of emails, advanced payments for goods not received, and money laundering. And it was uncovered by financial institutions and authorities, all working together across Germany, Ireland, the Netherlands, and coordinated by Interpol, which as you know is, is stationed at Lyon in France. So the first question we ask ourselves is, is it an old fraud or was it a new one? And again, Interpol just gives some examples, which I'm sure most of you are aware of and will have seen. Fraud, either online or the telephone, people asking for details, phishing, when they require you to log in, collect a link and get your details hacking into people's individual uh, 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 computer systems and counterfeiting. There have been cases of counterfeiting already, particularly with the uh, personal protection equipment, but it can also involve medical supplies and medicines. And we've already had one case, uh, certainly that I'm aware of in the UK, where a uh, gentleman uh, knocked at the door of a old age pensioner purporting to be from our National Health Service and told her she was entitled to one of the new vaccines, charged her, I think it's £190, uh, and injected her with a substance of which nobody is aware of. And I don't believe the suspect has currently been caught. And deliberate dissemination, which of course is the letting go of viruses into various computer systems. So is it an old fraud? I'd ask you to draw your own conclusions with that when we run through what actually happened. And this involves this, uh, uh, authorities in Germany. And you know there was absolute chaos trying to get this personal protection uh, equipment and the German authorities contacted two sales companies, one in Zurich in Switzerland and the other one at Hamburg in Germany. And they asked them if they could procure 15 million euros worth of face masks. As I said, it was a global shortage and this led the buyers to follow new leads in the hope of successfully securing the tasks. And one wonders if in trying to find these new leads to 
try and secure the masks, they actually followed their procurement procedures within the organization or within the German Health Authority. The buyers obtained an email address and a website they found which appeared to be linked to a legitimate company in Spain. Uh, and in fact, it later transpired the company in Spain was legitimate, but its details had been claimed by the fraudster. Via email, the uh, company claimed that they had 10 million masks, uh, but then got back to, uh, to the buyers to say that unfortunately, the delivery had fallen through, but they were able to refer them to a new and trusted dealer in Ireland. And the trusted dealer offered very kindly to put them in touch with yet another but different supplier in the Netherlands. The Irishman provided assurances that the Dutch company, or as it transpired, the alleged Dutch company could supply 10 million face masks. An agreement was made for the delivery of the, well, delivery of one and a half million masks, but they required an upfront payment of one and a half million euros. Just before the masks were due to be delivered, the Dutch company or somebody informed the buyers that they hadn't received the, uh, the funds, they hadn't received the money. And an emergency transfer of 880,000 euros was now required to secure the immediate dispatch of the masks that they were waiting for. And that money was uh, uh, transferred, but of course, well, not of course, but no masks turned up. And the buyers realized that they had been duped. They contacted their bank in Germany, who again contacted uh, Interpol, who set the investigations in motion. And a result of the work of, of Interpol and, and other bodies, uh, the Irish police, the Garda, as they're called, managed to identify the Irish company that was involved and managed to freeze one and a half million euros, uh, which was in that account. So they managed to recover one and a half million euros. Thank you. The Dutch authorities worked hard, tracked down the 880,000 euros, which had been transferred out of the German buyer's account. This was traced and again, half a million euros was in funds that had already been sent to the United Kingdom and was destined for an account in Nigeria. These monies have been returned to, uh, to the Netherlands and are currently, as I understand it, frozen by the authorities whilst the case proceeds. The important thing, I think, to uh, to try and demonstrate to everybody is that this was not a new fraud or a new type of fraud. The people who have been arrested had no connection whatsoever with the medical equipment industry. They were experienced fraudsters, saw an opportunity with the outbreak of COVID-19 and took full advantage of it. So, the little case study raises one or two issues. And the first one is, in a situation such as that, who would be responsible for carrying out any investigation? We see German, it was the German health authorities. We see that again, the buyers were in Germany and in Switzerland, Zurich in Switzerland. It involved a cloned company, which was a legitimate company in Spain, it involved Holland, 
It involved a trusted buyer in Ireland. The money was paid in to a bank account in England before it was transferred to Nigeria. And thinking of yourself in your situation back home, assuming that you received an allegation similar to this, how is it to be dealt with? Who should take responsibility for investigating this type of fraud? Perhaps some companies could be forgiven if they said, well, the victims were in Germany. The money is in Nigeria. There's no indication that any of our nationals were involved. In fact, you could argue that it was perhaps somebody's own fault because they didn't follow their own procedures that the money was stolen. If you are going to investigate it and you require evidence to be obtained from England, Spain, Holland, wherever, what is the process for obtaining that evidence so that it is acceptable in the courts where the case is finally going to finish up? If you're going to the courts, can the court and the judicial system actually have enough facilities to deal with uh, the offences when they come before them? Because they too, in many cases, have been devastated by financial cuts and indeed by the virus. Can you work as a team? Do you have the technical uh, uh, equipment? Do you know what the privacy laws are to enable you to gain access to bank accounts within foreign countries? So the basic issue is, do we know, and if you go back to your offices uh, tomorrow, wherever you come from, and give this set of circumstances, would you know or your staff know who to report it to and where to go to try and resolve the situation? Just one final slide, I think, Neil. And this is just to remind you from Interpol, types of frauds, particularly linked to COVID, telephone calls. People have had telephone calls saying that before they are admitted to have their vaccines done, then they must give their bank details. Or hospitals are phoning people saying that they need to pay money to buy uh, 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 pills, food, whatever it is for residents who are there. And so it goes on. Not new frauds, but frauds enabled by the current pandemic. And I just leave you again with the three reminders from Interpol is please be vigilant, be sceptical and stay safe. Thank you, Neil. Thank you very much indeed, Tim. Uh, there's some excellent uh, points there um, and some super questions already starting to appear, which we will uh, return to um, at the end. Uh, I think the point which Tim made on jurisdictions is a massive challenge for all of us um, and uh, trying to track um, money or movements uh, through so many different jurisdictions uh, and how that's done it could be the subject of uh, an entire uh, webinar in its own right. But with the growing amount of cybercrime that we see, this is an even bigger and more important issue uh, perhaps than it ever was. So uh, we have said now several times, we don't think there are any new uh, types of fraud particularly, but there are new vulnerabilities, new opportunities. Uh, and this is a quote uh, from uh, a professional in a hospital in the Czech Republic. At times of crisis, hackers see opportunity. Unfortunately, with so many hospital staff having to go above and beyond the call of duty in an effort to try and halt the spread of coronavirus, 
They aren't thinking about cybersecurity. Hackers know this and will be specifically targeting the healthcare sector. And sadly, that is what exactly what we have seen. So where are we now? Where has this got us to in this conversation? Should we be focusing on preventing uh, more attacks, prosecuting the ones which have occurred? Um, should we be focused on greater deterrence? Should we ignore some of these on the basis that you know, we are simply not going to have the resources to pursue all of the monies and incidences in which uh, monies have been fraudulently or corruptly taken? Or should we think about some kind of approach of forgiveness um, and maybe an amnesty? And interestingly, uh, there is an experiment in Japan where the Ministry of Economic, uh, Economy, Trade and Industry have implemented a system which exempts individuals uh, from prosecution who have received uh, coronavirus benefits illicitly uh, if, um, and then they're urging them uh, to just give us the money back, please. Uh, and some kind of amnesty like that, particularly uh, for low level, low value uh, offending may be appropriate. It may not. I think it's for each society and each um, jurisdiction to decide what is the right thing uh, for them. But it's important to remember that whilst, uh, as is quoted here, um, while some fraud was expected, the level of fraud is high and is due at least somewhat to poor internal controls and oversight. Now, it's important that we don't victim blame but it's also important that we do not lose sight of our responsibilities and our organization's responsibilities um, to maintain effective and appropriate um, controls and oversight. Now, at this point, uh, we should have been and we're going to be joined uh, by Carolyn Lamptey, who is our expert on um, uh, asset recovery. Sadly, um, she has uh, not been able to connect, but thanks to a different wonder of technology, uh, I have her speaking notes. So just bear with me for a moment. This is going to be far less interesting than if she was giving it to you, but you're going to get all of the information just presented rather as uh, you're going to get it now of somebody reading it off of a phone. So forgive us for that. Um, but the important thing is we have the content. So. Uh, Carolyn would have been talking about case strategies and making three uh, key issues. Um, one, that there is a decision to be made about whether to pursue the criminal route uh, of prosecution uh, and um, uh, punishment if the person is found guilty, and sanction, or the civil route where we are more concerned with recovery um, and she argues strongly, uh, as you will hear, for a two-pronged approach of actually doing both at the same time. Um, focusing on asset recovery and some of the issues there. Uh, and then she talks a bit about technology and disclosure. So bear with me. Uh, this is what she, she has to say. Picking up on some of the points that Tim has mentioned and looking at the issue from a prosecutor's point of view, as much as fraudsters are motivated by money, so prosecutors should be as well. Recovering those stolen monies and returning them to victims, as well as convicting the fraudsters. This should not be mutually exclusive. Things have moved on and many jurisdictions have enacted non-conviction based legislation to enable the recovery of criminal assets for all crimes and not just drugs related offences. A recent example of this, uh, she quotes, is in Ghana, where, as I mentioned, um, uh, she and I were working side by side last year and uh, a welcome to, to colleagues from Ghana. And I hope you will uh, allow us the number of times we're going to mention Ghana uh, in this, where in the process, uh, is in the process of amending its economic and organised 
Crime Office Act of 2010. She argues for this two pronged approach as part of a case strategy, which in the best case scenario is the criminal conviction of the accused and confiscation of the assets falling uh, under civil recovery of the assets that have been identified. A two pronged approach means that the asset tracing is an integral part of the criminal investigation and also assists in crystallizing the money laundering offenses that must be included with any predicate offense, i.e. the criminal offense from which the illicit uh, funds uh, or property have been gained. Um, that's the predicate offense. Once you have that, then you have uh, an issue around, so where is the, um, the proceeds of that crime, the benefit of that crime? And can that be um, recovered? Um, so uh, she says this is important, uh, whether it's as a standalone charge uh, being proffered against a certain accused um, and will always depend upon the evidence. This approach also informs the early, also informs the early identification of assets, which is critical. In her view, there is little point in securing a conviction and confiscation order if you have no idea of the asset position or worst, you are aware of the asset position, but have done nothing to prevent those assets from leaving the jurisdiction or being put beyond the control of the authorities. There are two important aspects to this. Firstly, it not only assists in establishing what the accused did with the funds stolen, but it also helps to unravel others uh, who may have been associated with the offending through other covert acts that either facilitate the offences or is not obvious to the offending. The second point is that it may help to unravel further criminality. This can be really crucial if the assets cannot be directly traced to the predicate offence and a standalone money laundering charge has not been proffered. Identifying other criminality can assist in supporting a civil recovery claim against the asset by using the evidence unearthed in relation to other crimes associated uh, and to prove the criminal taint of the asset. Uh, now, uh, she goes on to talk about uh, the importance of technology and data sharing uh, and to consider the um, opportunities uh, that arise there. Uh, and we have seen um, a, a request uh, or a comment from the EU Commissioner for Justice, COVID scams prompt Europe to press for data sharing as the headline. We know from our earlier experience that fraudsters see this pandemic as an opportunity to trick European consumers. And technology, uh, as we have demonstrated uh, by the fact that Carolyn couldn't join us because of a problem with technology, but we were able to at least describe what she was going to say, thanks to a different bit of technology. Technology cuts both ways. It makes the movement of um, illicit funds and the um, commission of economic and financial crime so much more easy. But it also, if we do data sharing effectively, makes it much harder to hide the trail. And there have been a number of initiatives um, to stop individuals hiding behind corporate entities um, and shielding their, their identity. Uh, and these include, um, and I'm happy to say that Ghana is one of the countries in the lead uh, on this issue, the registration of beneficial ownership um, or the identification, as is described in other jurisdictions, of persons of significant control. 
There's a range of information which is listed there, which I won't bother going through now, but you see the, the reference as well, um, which will differ from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And Ghana is at the moment going through a process of, of clarifying um, exactly what this is. But the key thing is to try and be able to identify the real person behind the corporate entity, not just by tracking through share ownership, but also in terms of significant control exercised in other ways. At the end of the day, something belongs to real people. And if that is a criminal asset or the product of crime, then if we can find out who the real person is, that has to be in our interests. So I've said, and we've demonstrated the issues around technology. So could I invite Denise please to launch uh, uh, the first of our three polls and to ask you, and please don't worry if you're not a prosecutor or you're not a police officer, we want your opinion really. And we have an amazing group of people with us uh, uh, from a great range of places. So this will be of great interest. <coughs> We would like to know, do you think technology has made it easier or more difficult to prosecute frauds? And when I say frauds, that could be a corrupt act, uh, any kind of economic or financial crime, basically. If you think it is easier, please uh, press A. If you think it's made it more difficult, please press B. Okay, and a similar type of exercise for our next question. You will be aware that there is an obligation on prosecutors to disclose um, evidence on which the prosecution will rely or which may assist the defense to the defense. This is called disclosure. And this has become a huge problem because, you know, in the, the old days, to seize all of the information uh, a potentially corrupt organization had just involved, uh, and I no disrespect to Tim and his colleagues, uh, a, a large group of, of, of big policemen with big black bags uh, bursting through the front door and grabbing every bit of paper in sight. Um, those days are long, long gone. And the in, almost infinite variety of electronic devices on which information can be stored makes disclosure incredibly difficult. Um, do you think that this has become more burdensome, harder for prosecutors in the light of technology? And again, if you think the answer is yes, press A, B, press no. And our final question, and again, it doesn't matter what your professional background is. This is almost a kind of a moral question. Should we still be prosecuting individuals if the stolen funds have been recovered? We've managed to get the money back. Should we still prosecute the individual? If you think the answer is yes, press A. If you think it's B, uh, sorry, if you're being this, no, press B. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for taking part in that. And we will look at those results um, in a few minutes. Uh, we'll just uh, give uh, Denise an opportunity to compile them. And Denise, in about five minutes time, I'll ask you for a, a summary of the, the answers, if, if uh, that would be OK. So to move... OK, thank you, Denise. So to move to the final couple of minutes of this presentation, um, there are clear and obvious benefits to the kind of data sharing. We've seen it um, in the, the Interpol case of the um, fraudulently offered masks. Um, we have seen it in another case where uh, our colleagues in Ghana have worked very, very effectively uh, with uh, police colleagues in the UK to repatriate £115,000 stolen through romance frauds 
Um, and the increase in romance fraud, which I will explain a little bit more in a moment, between October 2019 and October 2020, there was a 26% increase in this type of fraud um, in the UK, against people in the UK. Now, a romance fraud, or sometimes it's called a love fraud, is where um, somebody befriends you, someone you've not met, someone you don't know, someone you may never meet, uh, becomes your friend. And, you know, they, they're really nice people and you enjoy emailing them and chatting to them and they seem to enjoy doing that with you. And then they have a problem uh, and they ask for a small amount of money to help them out. Uh, and it's not very much, so you send it um, and they may ask for a little bit more, you send a little bit more. And then they may offer you an investment opportunity to thank you for your kindness. Uh, and you're drawn into uh, a process of, of fraud, which is very difficult to get out of and also very embarrassing. And victims suffer uh, a discouragement to report this because they're embarrassed. And also, yeah, it's not a nice situation to have to talk about. This 20% increase how much of that is due to home working uh, and what duty of care do employers have to people who are working from home? What rights do employees have and what rights do employers have? Um, and again, a quote here, you see the reference, the shift to working from home during the pandemic has led to a boom in surveillance software. The technology threatens to blur further the boundaries between home and work. This sort of technology is more likely to create a culture of paranoia and destroy trust within an organization. It is unlikely that many of us who may be home working uh, are going to go back to offices very soon. Met a number of people who are home working will never be going back to offices. Those for them, office work may never return. What does that mean for the relationship, particularly in terms of protecting employees between employer and employee? In the final couple of slides, we put this in because we are hopeless. And I use I'm going to say this for all of us. And please tell me if you think we are wrong about your jurisdiction. But I think in general, we're not very good at learning the lessons of the past. And many people have spoken of this present situation as um, unparalleled, unique. Um, but we have, in different ways, been in similar situations before. And during the Ebola crisis, uh, just a few years ago, uh, there was significant evidence of fraud. Um, the Red Pr Cross talked about what had been um, perpetrated against them. But again, these are old Frauds, overbilling, fake invoices, inflated prices. And if we go back 100 years, we see similar sort of things at the time of the so-called Spanish flu pandemic. Um, hospitals running out of protective equipment, um, people selling um, unspecified medicines. Um, this is not really so new, perhaps. The circumstances are terrible. Uh, but there are a few questions there about whether, in particular, it's time for fraud and corruption to become a higher priority for many, many jurisdictions. Certainly in the UK and in many um, European and other countries, fraud is now the single largest type of crime committed. And the big question for us is, will this crisis lead to more resources and a higher profile for tackling fraud and corruption? Or will it institutionalize chumocracy and less accountability and transparency? And chumocracy is one of the new things which have come out of this pandemic. And it's a term used in the UK, chum as in friend. This is giving contracts to your friends. Um, you know, rule by who you know or who you're married to or who you went to school with. Um, and there is a danger that, well, we're at a, I think many of our societies are at a point where 
which way we go, whether we see greater uh, stress on tackling financial crime or uh, less accountability and transparency is a challenge. Now, all of this is happening against a background of wonderful, wonderful things being done. Uh, not only bravery within societies, but huge generosity uh, between societies. And those images there are of um, medical supplies, uh, PPE being shipped around Africa by Ethiopian Airlines, funded by the Chinese billionaire Jack Ma. Uh, a very recent, just a couple of days ago, an image celebrating India's um, gift of uh, vaccines to Brazil uh, and a picture of uh, Indian vaccines arriving in Nepal. It is our job, for those of us who are concerned with fraud and corruption, to cover the backs of the people who are doing great things by trying to reduce the amount of uh, damage that's done by people who want to abuse opportunities. So thank you very much indeed. Let me pause at that point and perhaps we could have a few questions. Okay, um, I'll, Tim, if I run through the questions, oh, we've got some excellent questions. Thank you very, very much. Um, I'm going to read the questions if uh, you'll allow me to. Um, and then, Tim, uh, perhaps you and I can divvy up who answers them. Uh, uh, there is a question about um, corruption in Europe. I think we've demonstrated um, that fraud clearly exists in Europe. And we, unfortunately, we're quite good at it in Europe and particularly in uh, the UK. Um, corruption, I think, exists everywhere. Um, and in terms of the question, where do you find it? I think you find corruption wherever the public sector and the private sector come together and money changes hands, particularly where anyone has any discretion in how much to charge or how much to give or what to permit. I think it's a reality of societies everywhere. What would you say, Tim? Uh, no, I, I agree totally. It's, uh, it's always difficult to combat because you have a giver and a receiver, both, of course, who uh, are committing uh, criminal offences. Um, and there are so many different societal uh, definitions, if you like, of what is and what isn't corrupt. Uh, we can go way back through history, and I suspect worldwide, corruption has existed, uh, always will exist. And it's up to us to try and get as many policies and procedures in place that we can combat it. Absolutely. Right. Another question. Um... If fraud is considered a common crime, when can it be considered a crime of corruption locally and internationally? Well, I think um, the difference between fraud and corruption is this abuse of position of trust. Yes. And I think that's what changes a fraud into a corrupt act. Would you add anything to that, Tim? No, no. no okay, okay, on to the next question. Um, I apologize if I'm rushing you, Tim. I want to make sure we cover all the questions. Um, how low or high is the probability that those criminals, I think this is in relation to your uh, case study, Tim, mm -hmm. uh, will be identified and arrested and that the money stolen be recovered, taking into account the fact that those people are extremely well organized in a digital world? Ex an excellent question. Um, the first thing which I tried to say at the end is that, you know, we need, uh, or the world effectively is a global village, and we need a global response to crimes such as this. And you look at all the different jurisdictions that are involved. It's a question, really, of having leadership, of having people working together, uh, and within your own organisations to decide what are your priorities going to be? And if you look at the case study that we did, and as I tried to point out, there's so many different jurisdictions uh, involved. 
uh, people could be forgiven to say, well, why should we be wasting our money, uh, our resources? We've got enough problems of our own. And as I said, with the case study, uh, um, countries could legitimately have said in some cases, uh, uh, the victim doesn't live here. Nobody in our country has lost anything uh, and none of our citizens are involved. So the answer in crudely to the question, I'm afraid, is with difficulty. Uh, fraudsters do get caught. The success rate with getting them to court is is relatively good, um, but it does take a vast amount of resources which people have got to decide with so many other competing things in this world uh, effectively where are the resources going to go. Yes, absolutely. And a, a linked question to that or, or you know, on a similar area, um, what has been your success rate when the victim is from country A and the criminals are in countries B, C, D. This is a major hurdle for fraud investigators. We typically seek assistance from Interpol Network, uh, and this is another challenge. Tim? It, 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 is, it's, it is a total challenge, um, and I think it starts right at the beginning. If you're going to start on the fraud investigation, you have to lay out what your parameters are, uh, what you expect to get from the investigation. It may be cases where retrieving of the money, uh, disrupting the fraud, shutting it down, is actually more important than arresting people. Um, and these have to be decided at the beginning of the investigation. You have to be realistic about what the end result is going to be. Excellent. No, quite right. Quite right. It is massively difficult. And, um, you know, a cynic would say, um, if you live in country A, you commit your crimes in country B, and you keep the proceeds of the crime in country C, uh, you're making life very, very difficult for those who are trying to stop your criminality. And, but it, and this is one of the benefits, sorry, just to say this is one of the benefits of data sharing. And that is an area where technology does make it easier, but there has to be a will to share. Sorry, Tim. Well, I was just going to say the whole issue now with, with technology is, you know, where does jurisdiction lie in so many cases? You can be stealing money uh, from bank accounts in countries you've never visited in your life and transferring them to other parts of the world and, and never go anywhere near the place. It's, well, as, as was the, illustrated, I think, by your um, case study. And I think, I um, may well be exaggerating, but I think it may well be true to say that the perpetrators of that crime never left their own house on a completely different continent. Yeah, I suspect that's absolutely right. I don't know, but I suspect that that's the case. OK, we've got about three or four more questions. So I'm recognising that we're running over time, but I'm keen to uh, continue with the questions. We obviously... If you have to leave us, thank you for being with us. Um, but we'll carry on for a few more minutes uh, to cover these other questions. OK, uh, next, Tim, considering the unprecedented nature of the pandemic, how should organisations set about adjusting their internal control environment to reduce risk? For example, what should a company's fraud monitoring and identification efforts entail? Again, an excellent question. I suppose that uh, ideally your, your fraud systems, fraud policies, uh, uh, fraud culture, which is probably as important as anything else, should be in place at the moment. And when the pandemic or such as this comes along, it's largely a question of volume that actually presents the real difficulty. If, uh, sorry, if your groundwork is right and the principles are basically in place, uh, then provided you have the right account, uh, account, uh, accountability and, transpar and transparency in recording uh, decisions that are made and variations that are made within your policies, uh, um, that's, I think, is what it's all about at the end of the day. It is about accountability 
to be able to see who's made what decision why and why they've done it. Yeah. No, I think you're absolutely right. And I think the point about culture is vitally important. I mean, two massively important things have happened here. One, exactly what Tim said about the volume has changed. The other is what um, uh, we call sector shift. So areas uh, which were would not have expected 18 months ago to be the subject of dramatic amounts of fraud now are. And that is a huge challenge for them. So, I mean, I imagine 18 months ago, if we had talked about um, the fraudulent sale of um, protective equipment for hospitals, this would have been a really marginal, marginal discussion. And, and people would probably say it simply doesn't happen. Uh, so in essence, the culture should stay the same. Internal controls should remain, but sectors which are now presented with far greater fraud than they ever were before, I totally accept, face a challenge. And you know, I wish we could talk more about all of these questions. We've got a couple more, uh, and then we'll bring this to a, a close. Um, uh, there's a point quite rightly made about you know, things come down to leadership, as always. Um, don't you think that if the leadership is right, corruption can be drastically reduced, if not totally eliminated, as in the case in some notable countries? Tim? Uh, yes, obviously, leadership and example starts from the top. And uh, uh, I would uh, totally agree, you know, with, with the questioner from that aspect. Uh, if uh, the top is, is uh, rotten, uh, you can't blame people lower down the, uh, the ladder from saying that they would like a piece of the cake as well. Absolutely. No, I think leadership is, is a vital thing. Um, it's not the only answer, and sadly, there is no single only answer. Otherwise, uh, the problem wouldn't exist. It's one of many things, but it's probably the single most important thing. Yeah. In the case study by Tim, which country took jurisdiction of the investigation and possible prosecution of the matter? Uh, the short answer is I don't know. Uh, as I said, I got this from uh, an Interpol report. Um, so I don't know, I don't even know if the case has been concluded, so I can't actually answer that uh, um, at, at the moment, I'm afraid. Okay, okay. right. Um, but again, uh, whatever, whichever did, key to any success is sharing of effective and rapid sharing of information. Yes. And the final question, what is the best strategy for a country starting out to tackle the 90% of people who may see bribes as a natural reaction to secure a permit, etc. I'll start, well, I can see well, you're well, doing... I was going to say, is that, are, are we saying that uh, uh, it's a culture whereby 90% of the people uh, uh, think they have to pay bribes uh, to obtain the services that uh, that they are entitled to uh, under the state. Yeah. Um, I think that actually goes with the formal question. It comes from uh, leadership. And if the organisation is such that it is uh, the culture of the organisation, and if you want to get anything done, you pay a bribe because it's the cheapest uh, well, the easiest way to do it, um, then the only way you can do it is by education and by example. And also by having the right policies within the organization so that if there are corrupt officials, that they are prosecuted and, and, and dealt with. And also that within that culture, if people wish to complain, you have a whistleblower's policy or you have a policy whereby people who want to do the right thing have got facilities to go and do it. And a whistleblowing policy 
may be a very, very good start. Absolutely. I mean, I think um, and with any of the questions, if you would like to pursue any of these issues further or if anyone else would like to, to raise things, please do so via um, PAI and we'd be happy to discuss them more. But there's a very interesting case study way back at the time of the uh, NAP report into corrupt policing in New York, I think way back, maybe even in the 1970s which basically said the entire police force is corrupt. Every single police officer is taking a bribe. It is institutionalized. You cannot dismiss the entire police force. What are you going to do? And the report um, separated the 100% of corrupt officers into what it called the grass eaters and the meat eaters, kind of using a a dinosaur image or a wildlife image and basically said the grass eaters they are just doing what everybody else is doing they're taking low level bribes it's a pain in the neck but it's not massively um distorting life um but the meat eaters they're the ones who are feeding off the grass eaters they're the ones who are organizing all of this they're the ones who are kind of in league with organized crime and they're the ones we need to care about so in many ways, I think the answer is, what is the corruption you care about? What matters to society? But we, we will pursue this. If any of you would like to pursue this more with us, we would be delighted to. But I'm conscious we're stealing now your time and that was unethical of us. So last two thoughts. Uh, and then I'm going to ask Denise to tell us the results of the poll and then hand over to Claire to close. So just two more minutes. We have two final thoughts. <clears throat> This is a quote uh, from this gentleman who owns uh, uh, La Gourmet restaurant uh, in Italy, who has had lots and lots of problems with the local mafia and has been very heroic in his refusal to pay protection money. Um, and uh, his place was closed down several times by the mafia. When he finally got it open, it was closed down by the pandemic. And he said the mafia and COVID are both pandemics. We'll destroy the virus with a vaccine, but the fight against the mafia will take longer. Yeah. And I think you can say exactly the same about fraud and corruption. And uh, a thought from a, a very good friend of ours who works uh, and helps us on our courses uh, that we run, Toby Reiser, who's head of IT audit and deputy chief auditor at a major Swiss bank. We can't prevent every single fraud from happening, but we can prevent our organizations from turning fraudulent and corrupt. And if there's one thing I think we should all try to commit ourselves to, it's exactly that. Now, thank you very, very much. Uh, so, Denise, what, what res are the results of our polls, please? Mm -hmm. I think we might. Denise? Denise, have we got Hello, Yeah, so I've just launched, uh, you should be able to see it on your screen, the results of the first poll. So for has technology made it easier or more difficult to prosecute frauds? Uh, 20 people said easier and 16 said more difficult. So slightly ahead on the easier. Can you see that on your screen, Neil? I can. So on question, and shall I carry on? Thank you so much, Denise. Yeah. On okay. question two, has yeah. disclosure become more burdensome uh, for prosecutors in light of technology? 75% uh, said yes, 25% said no. That's interesting. Yeah. And... I'm very keen to see the answer to the last one as well. Ah, so uh, should we be prosecuting individuals if the stolen funds have been recovered? 95% say yes, 5% say no. Wow, thank you so much. That we're going to be thinking about this and talking about this for some time. That's excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. 
forgive us for stealing more of your time uh, than we had said we would. We'll hand over now to Claire, um, both from Tim and myself. Thank you very much indeed for some excellent questions, some yes. fascinating discussion in the chat room, I see. And we wish you well. And thank you again. Claire. Thank you. I think Denise is going to hand control back to me. In a moment. But maybe you can hear me anyway, can you? Yes. Oh, well, okay. let's, let's go ahead. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, that's it. Uh, thank you very, very much, um, Neil and Tim. And, and so sorry that Carolyn couldn't join us. But um, thank you, Neil, for um, taking us through her, her notes and her, her ideas. Uh, she sends her apologies and and is very disappointed uh, that she, she the technology let her down. Um, so our, our next um, workshop on fraud and corruption, uh, of, of which uh, Neil and Tim are the co-directors, um, is scheduled for May this year in Dubai. Um, and uh, again, later in the year in October, we have our, uh, one scheduled at our London training center. We hope, we hope that um, travel and, and, and COVID related restrictions will will have uh, eased significantly by then, but um, we are happy to offer the programme uh, virtually if face-to-face -face, uh, is, is still not possible. Um, and they do provide a really nice blend of briefings, practical work, um, international network working, and, um, and where we can um, and where, where it's possible to come to the UK, then visits to counterparts dealing with uh, fraud and corruption issues. Um, and ethical standards in, in, in the public sector. Um, so uh, we do hope very much that um, uh, you'll be interested in, in joining um, some of those workshops. Uh, you can see, I think, a list of, um, of uh, events and uh, workshops uh, and webinars upcoming. Um, we have a webinar next week, on uh, this time next week, on Parliament and the, and, and the role of, that Parliament are playing um, in, uh, in this crisis as well. Um, so it's been a real pleasure and thank you for joining us um, and thank you for all those really super interesting questions and, um, uh, uh, and, and taking part in, in the polls. And uh, just once again, thank you very, very much, Neil, Tim uh, and Denise, thank you for organising us all. Uh, we will be sending you the slides and I think a recording of the session. So if your own internet connections have been erratic um, then at least you will have uh, I think a recording to um, uh, to replay. Uh, best wishes to you all please stay safe and um, we look forward to hopefully being in touch with you in, in the near future. Okay so that's goodbye from uh, from me, goodbye from London, bye now, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. Goodbye.